Hey there, this is Keith Cauley at CES 2023 with Thrive, a Bridgestone America's podcast on the road today. We are in Las Vegas talking to industry leaders, partners, other people with Bridgestone bringing the future of mobility to life, talking about sustainable mobility, digital transformation. It's all happening around us here at CES 2023. And today we are excited to talk to uh, a gentleman who has been at the forefront of some of this, I feel like for a, a good number of years and has a little bit of expertise to share. Uh, but we are joined by Eric Chagnon, who is the general manager, automotive mobility and transportation at Microsoft. I feel like that name brings a little bit of, the uh, title brings a little bit of gravitas to it itself, but thank you so much for joining us. Very nice talking to you, Keith. Yeah, well, I think we've got a lot to dive into. Uh, really interested in learning about your perspective, your experience. Um, we do love to start with a little bit of background on all of our guests so we get to learn where your perspective is coming from. So if you could, what's been your career journey and how did you get to your role currently at Microsoft? Yeah, it's a good question. So I started uh, writing software when I was uh, 13 years old, which is, you know, just a few years ago. And, um, and then at the time, uh, you know, m my dream was really, you know, to be able to start to, you know, create products and I was very interested by what Apple was doing mm -hmm. and uh, my dream at that time was to work for Apple so I started writing software and as a as a teenager I was in exchange of my work uh, I will uh, I will get some hardware mm -hmm. and I still remember you know I worked for two months and I had a you know big piece of hardware which was a hard drive and the hard drive was uh, was 20 megabytes, right, at the time, you know, any, anyway, long times ago. Uh, and then I continued working on, on, on the tech side. And what I did on the tech side, uh, I created product, product line, and, and then I moved to creating businesses. So at the end of the day, when people, they ask me who I am really, I will say I love uh, disruptive innovation, but I'm very pragmatic on the way, uh, you know, you can bring, you know, disruptive innovation you know, to market. So anyway, um, so I don't know if that's no, enough a background. Bit. Yeah. Oh, sure, sure. But that, so you've worked, I think, in the automotive industry before. We don't need to avoid it. You've worked for Michelin right, in right, the right. past. Um, and then kind of how did it evolve to that opportunity? And then right. to Microsoft being, if you wanted to work for Apple, I'm, I would imagine Microsoft is a pretty good alternative as right, well. Right, right, <laughs> Yeah, and, and I can give you my, so I worked oh, sure, for sure. Apple for seven years, oh, good. 10 years for HP. Uh, then I created two startups. Uh, so one that worked and one that did not work. And then uh, then I worked for Michelin. So I was the global chief digital officer for Michelin for six years. And then at that time, I felt like, you know what, it's the right time for me, you know, to get back to the tech industry. And when I take a look at, um, you know, all the tech companies, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I decided to come working for Microsoft. And one of the reasons for that is that I believe that most of the companies in the mobility space, they are really at this, the middle of this transformation from being a product company to being a services company. And all of them, at the end of the day, they want to become software companies. And uh, when I take a look at all the major players, I really believe that, um, you know, Microsoft is interesting because uh, Microsoft is not competing with the business model of their customers and their partners. Mm -hmm. So I said, you know what, from all the companies, I believe that the, the values, the culture, uh, you know, that Microsoft has, I think it's better than the others and will enable, you know, all the, the OEMs, tier one, tier two, et cetera, to do their transformation you know, with a company that they can trust. So anyway, so that's what I, yeah. why I decided to well, be there. It makes a lot of sense. And I think you, you mentioned it right there. One of the things we wanted to focus on with you was this idea of the digital transformation and the evolution that is really across the industry as a whole. I mean, for those walking the floor here, the, it's now an entire hall at CES focused on vehicle technology and mobility solutions. Uh, what are the biggest trends and movements that people are coming to you at Microsoft or that you see people needing to make in the industry? Yeah, I, I think the, the to summarize the digital transformation of people, of companies, sorry, um, I, I always say uh, it's 95% about mindset, culture, 
change management, and only 5% about technology. So very often, um, there is people that they believe that, uh, you know, they need to bring this and this kind of technology, and then it's really going to transform the company. But I really believe that for companies that have been on the market for decades, yeah. then no, 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 it's, it's, it's very different than that. It's really everything about the human side of the digital transformation. So that, that, that's one aspect. Um, now, if you take a look at traditional companies, they are used to selling products. And selling services and selling software is very, very, very different than, than selling products. And to some extent, it's almost like if you try to combine two DNA codes that are very, very different. So on one side, you know you, know you have the product, you know the life cycle of the product. And, and then from the other side, you have service and digital, which is very different by nature. So I think that the challenge of most of the companies if, is how do you make sure that these two ways of operating, you know, could be efficient, could run efficiently, you know, on the same roof of, of the same company. So companies, they come to see us and they say, guys, you are the software company at the end of the day. So you are the software company. We need your help on, uh, you know, what does it mean? So do you build software organization? Uh, you know, we talk about agile, you know, these kind of things. But also they will ask us, okay, what does it mean to sell, market, support, you know, software and services kind of solution? So anyway, so that's where we help, um, you know, our customers. And we're in that, I think for those who've listened to us have previous conversations on the podcast, you're working, I'm sure, with Bridgestone is very much in that setting right now of this digital transformation, right. products to services. I think naturally you talk, it's an interesting kind of layout that you put on, 95% of it is not the technology. It's the people, it's the culture, it's the human mind of operating. Um, we see, I think, a lot of that is there's a natural hesitation to change as humans, right? Wow. How do you approach, I guess, working through those boundaries and bringing those people who are hesitant along for the ride? Yeah, I, I think th there is at least uh, two tips I can give you. The first one uh, is the outside in. So I think that uh, as much as you can, you should be able to bring people from the outside, people sometimes that are not directly, you know, in the same industry that you are, but who went or already through this journey. And then you should be able to bring, you know, the knowledge inside the company. And I think that's what you do today, you know, mm -hmm. with the podcast, you know, giving perspective, you know, from the outside world. It's very powerful, let me tell you that much, because sometimes when I will say something inside the companies, you know, people will listen to me, but not really. Now, when it was another chief digital officer explaining exactly the same thing, then guess what? It will be m m much more powerful. The second thing that I learned, and I'm going to make a black and white statement, which could be right or wrong, but anyway, <laughs> uh, the second thing I learned is that th there is really two types of people, I will say, in, inside big companies. So there is people who really love innovation. Mm -hmm. And when you love innovation, guess what? You love change. You, you thrive on, on change, you need change, otherwise you get bored, right? So, and then for these people, the only thing that you need to do, you need to tell them, okay, where they are today, what is the from, and where you want to go. And they will start to imagine what is the future, all the benefits of the future. They will be very excited, even if, you know, there will be a lot of uncertainties and then they will be able to, you know, deliver the future state, right? Now, there is a second side of the population inside companies who are very scared of change. Sure. Very uncomfortable, very uncomfortable with uncertainties. So anyway, so I had a coach and then the coach told me, Eric, you need to ask four questions with this kind of people. I said, okay, so what is it? So he said, okay, number one, okay, you need to tell them what are the disadvantages of today's situation, okay? Okay, great. You need to tell them what are the advantages of the future state. And then you need to ask two additional questions, which is what are the advantages of the current situation and what are the disadvantages of the future situation? And when you do that, guess what happened? It's almost like you open the Pandora box, you demonstrate empathy, and then you will really understand what are, what are the blockers that people they have, you know, to be able to move forward. I will give you a simple example, mm -hmm. right? So I talked to um, a data scientist doing design of products. And, you know, 
I'm, I'm, I'm an excited guy. I'm excited by the cloud. I'm excited by AI. So I said, oh, you know, it's great. Here is to the situation. You design your products on your side. And then tomorrow, using the cloud, using artificial intelligence, you will be able to leverage the work from others, right? For me, that's enough. If you just tell that to me, I'm very excited about that. Sure. Right? Now, I ask the question, what are the advantages of today's situation? And then they say, oh, you know what? I feel that when I have everything on my PC, I have power. I have my own design on my own PC. I'm controlling everything. Okay, so what are the disadvantages of you know, the future state? The disadvantages was, okay, now if all my, you know, what I'm doing, all the work that I'm doing is shared with others. If others are able to get better than me because they leverage my work, I'm not sure I feel super comfortable about that. But the good thing is that when you ask the questions, at least you understand, you know, what you need to address. And then we address these kind of challenges and then they were able yeah. to move forward. It seems like straightforward questions, but then also turning the questions a little bit to just expand or reposition the perspective a yes, little bit, right? Absolutely. And it opens up dialogue. It opens dialogue and that, because, uh, you know, w w when you are in charge of driving digital inside a company, mm -hmm. of course I'm going to say that digital is amazing. <laughs> what, what should I say, right? Now, I, I really need to display empathy and really understand what are the key blockers and make sure I can answer to them. So. You don't open it up with, I love change. Let's all love no, change yeah, right, together. Right, right, we don't, yes. That's not the opening no, line, no, right? No, yeah. um, I think one of the other things you mentioned is uh, companies that have decades of right. roots and foundations. I mean, Bridgestone has been around for 90 years, right, Firestone right. 120. Right, right. You talk about evolving beyond tires right, and right. people immediately are like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Right. How do you get, how do you work with that, I guess? Right. No, I, I think the, 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 what is key at the end of the day, and that was the same, by the way, for the transformation of Microsoft. Mm -hmm. One of the first learning is you need to honor the past to be able to invent the future. So you, you, you need to pay a lot of attention and, and you, you, you really need to display that, you know what, you know, companies that have been there, you know, for 100 years, guess what, some amazing people I've been able to create innovation along the way for decades, and, and you, you need to admire that. So you need to really spend time on all the innovation, all the things that this company they have been create, that they created, and being aware, being able to communicate on that. And I think that you just need to say, you know what, guys, at the end of the day, digital is just the next step. You, you have been innovating for decades, you know, 120 years. Mm -hmm. Great. Digital is the, just the next web. So don't make it too complex. <laughs> you know, it's just the next web. The other thing that I've seen also is that um, sometimes uh, there is some chief digital officers who love to be uh, very technical. And, and it's almost like the, the, the I don't know, they, they want to display that they are smarter than <laughs> others. And they use things that people that do not understand. Sure. So I think you need to be obsessed at making it as simple as possible. Yep. So for example, when when, um, when you start to use artificial intelligence, okay, the technical side behind that is is complex. Sure. But then, you know, I was always talking about, uh, you know what, it's just going to augment what you are doing. So it's not, it's not going to replace you, and I think it's not going to replace <laughs> them, but it's going to make your life easier, your work life better. You are going to get better with your customer. You are going to get better at what you are. That's it. It's just going to assist you, right? It's like an extra brain that it's uh, outside your core brain, but it's not going to replace everything that you are doing. So anyway, so I think being obsessed at putting yourself in the shoes of the others and making sure that you not you do not scare them. I think it's uh, it's critical. I hope that people listening see some of that because I think you know Paulo Ferrari, who's our America CEO, Shu Ishibashi, who is our global CEO. We talk about there was Bridgestone 1.0, 2.0, and then now we're in 3.0. So they're building on foundations. And Paolo talks about our foundations as a core part of his vision strategy. So I hope that that does resonate. And maybe wow. hearing it from the outside, like yeah, you said, right, helps that drive it home a little bit, which yeah, is nice. Yeah. Um, the, the last one I wanted to talk about in this idea of transformation is an idea of partnership, co-creation, working wow. with other industry wow. leaders. You said a little bit of outside in from a perspective standpoint, wow. but 
an awareness of a company maybe that they can't do it all themselves? And how do you approach or think about that perspective? Right. So I think that um, um, if I take a look at, uh, at uh, you know, and I will start with technology companies. Mm -hmm. In the technology world, uh, and I was working for HP, uh, so the biggest um, uh, vendor of HP on the laser jet business was Canon. Hmm. Okay, Canon. All you know, the, all the laser jet engine were made by Canon at one point of time. Now, the biggest competitor of HP on the laser jet business was Canon. So, so it's very, it's very interesting this kind of relationship where hmm. okay, your biggest vendor at the same time is your biggest competitor, right? So what, what's very interesting with the, with the tech companies is that the, the tech companies, I think, are, are great at understanding what is core and what is non-core, hmm. okay? And now on everything that is core, tech companies, they are going to furiously protect their IP, make sure that, you know, they, they, they keep the differentiation, etc. Mm -hmm. Now, on what is non-core, Guess what? They are going to partner even with their worst competitor, right? So I think that um, uh, if I take a look at you know all the companies in the mobility space, OEM, tier one, uh, tier two, etc., I think that they are not there yet. Hmm. I think that they are used to you know they build everything on their own. Uh, they believe that they will be able to uh, you know master everything on their own, right? And I really think that they have to use exactly the same process that the companies they are using at really understanding what is core and what is non-core. And uh, so anyway, now with tech companies uh, specifically, uh, whoever they are, but of course uh, it's better if it's Microsoft, <laughs> uh, I think that Microsoft and others are making significant investments on the cloud, on digital technology. Um, so sometimes people, they ask me, um, you know, what is Microsoft doing? I say, okay guys, just realize we do from Xbox to quantum computers yeah. and everything, you know, in the middle. So anyway, so we do massive investment. So I think that, um, you know, companies like Bridgestone, they really should understand, you know, how could, how could they leverage this investment? Yeah. You know, you know, what can they do that you will still defend yourself, but by leveraging, you know, the, the technology that we have. So anyway, so back to your question, sure. I, th I think it will make uh, everybody inside companies mo much more comfortable is they really understand what is core and they really understand what is non-core. And I did that several times. And usually when, when you start to, to do this process, everybody is telling you that everything is of core. Of course, everything's a everything priority. Everything is core, everything <laughs> is a priority, everything. But guess what? That's not true. And I think that, you know, probably you should learn from the experience of, uh, you know, the tech companies. It's another thing, you know, Paolo and ishibashi san have been very focused on to do what we want to do in the future, we need to co-create. There's people right. who can make what we want to do better. And then we have things that we can offer vice versa, right? right. So it's a beautiful thing. And it's a mindset change. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. So. Exactly, exactly. Well, thank you so much, Eric, for thank taking you. a few minutes. It's been great to talk to you um, and excited to see the future as we build it all together. That's thank great. you very much. Absolutely. And reminder to our listeners, uh, you can listen to all of our podcast episodes wherever it is that you prefer to listen to your podcasts. Uh, just search, search for Thrive Bridgestone. You can also find the videos to watch on our YouTube page for Bridgestone Americas. And if you have a topic you'd like to recommend or a question you'd like to ask, just send an email to thrivepodcast at bfusa. Dot com. I'm Keith Cauley. Thanks for listening. I want to remind you, even from Las Vegas, to keep on keeping on. And remember that at Bridgestone, today, tomorrow, together, we thrive. Be good, everybody.